Welcome to Shovelware Diggers. Our dig team is currently excavating the Soft Key Shareware 2000 Hit Games 2CD Collection. You can find a link in the video description containing the entire directory structure of this archive. Here's what our diggers have for week 177. For more information on how to join the dig team, simply follow the Patreon link in the video description. Now without further ado, let's get started. First up, JP Ronnie's dug up win games backslash comp backslash baseball. Well, clearly some kind of baseball game. Cause, you know, base ba. It's gonna be baseball, right? Well, let's find out. Um actually it's called base base. <laughs> um, okay. And then we've got a whole bunch of setup files here. I'm guessing it's probably already been set up, just judging by the fact that all these files are here. But then at the same time, it's also including stuff like 3D and VB Run and stuff, and hmm. Well, hopefully this stuff's already installed, otherwise we'll have to run the setup program. But let's see what the readme says. Baseball database is shareware. Copyright 94, the Mat Matinal group? I think that's Matinal group. Or something like that. Um, apparently it's from December 94, so this is actually pretty late to the scene then, for Windows 3.1. Okay, yes, yeah, so you do have to run the um, setup program, otherwise it gives you this air screen. So, yeah, let's go run the setup. Initializing setup. If you've gotten this far, baseball database is probably ready to run. What? Oh, goody, it's another program that also needs share running. Uh... Although it did actually get this far, so maybe it did install the DLL files properly? Either way, it says it's worth $35. Um... Well, let's see if this is actually running properly. So, well, the window maximizes, but there's nothing in the window right now, so I'm not sure exactly where we're at. But anyways, so I guess show all batters. Oh, wow. So not only does it maximize properly, but we've also got these little windows. So this is something you typically see in a word processor or such, where the main window itself can have child windows inside of it. And that's what's happening here. So kudos for actually doing that part right, because that's not easy. But yeah, it looks like we have a whole bunch of stats here. And it's like using a proper table view and everything. We've got a list of batters here. And apparently we can search by name and such. So if we hit G, Okay, and it just brings it just brings us straight to the first entry with a G in it. Oh wow, it's even got like yearly stats for the different players here. We've got like a Gary Getty, I think. Again, I'm not I'm not really the best at pronouncing things, but yeah, it's looking it's showing like all kinds of different um stats here for this player across multiple years. It even has a list of baseball parks in here. Now that's something I wasn't expecting to see. So it's like showing the, um, showing last capacity, whatever that means. I mean, I know what capacity means, but why would it be calling last capacity? I don't know. Okay, and apparently we can also pull up uh, graphs here. Now this is saying average runs per game per team, 1901 to 1945. I'm not entirely certain what it means with the different um, letters here. Hmm. So yeah, it looks like there is a lot of information <laughs> in this program here. So I guess what it comes down to is if you're a really huge baseball fan and you want a nice massive compiled list of all kinds of like player info and team info and park info and stuff, then it's just a matter of if that's worth $35 for you or not, because that's a registration fee. So, and apparently by, uh, even though it says the Matinale group there, it also says some data access tools supplied by Sheridan Software Systems. I believe that's referring to the 3D stuff and everything, because I think they were the company that produced those libraries that got used in so many different things. Could be wrong about that. 
But yeah, basically, we've got a huge database program here for baseball stats, and it works as one would expect. So if that's worth $35 to you, then here you go. Next up, Alex has dug up DOS games backslash arcade 2 backslash nuker. I'm almost afraid to ask. Um, I got a nuke.doc from 2000. What? That's not possible. And then a mis and then a misrepresented date with a 2107 there for the executable. So that could be any file date. Um, okay. I understand at the very least the file, the date being wrong on the executable in that manner, but a 2000 date on the doc file, that's just weird. Um, what is it even in here? So nuclear simulation by Philip Burr and documentation by Paul Anderson. So apparently this is from 1991. You are the mission controller during the Middle East War. You are given orders to destroy all strategic military installations while keeping casualties low. I'm pretty sure the use of nuclear weapons precludes the ability to keep casualties low, but let's just see here. Remember, this program is case sensitive. Make sure your caps lock is off because we couldn't be bothered to simply check the case for different things. <laughs> oh, you know, in basic, it's merely the um, U case command or the L case command to convert a string entirely into lowercase or entirely into uppercase. And I'm pretty sure equivalents exist in C++ or in other programming languages. And even if they didn't, it's not hard to make conversions for this kind of stuff. So this always bothers me <laughs> when I see programs do this because there's no excuse. There's really no excuse to be that lazy, to not just check for both states or alter the resulting input automatically <laughs> so it's like uh okay rant over you'll be asked for a name type your last name if you wish or use an alias you'll be sent then to the main menu given a menu with three options check for your mail control center or exit to dos well at least the guy's only asking for five dollars and that's actually canadian dollars so five dollars canadian when this game came out wouldn't actually be worth that much it'd be like three dollars fifty american i believe <laughs> But anyway, so that's the end of the doc file. So let's go. Nuke. This program's not free. Yeah, we know. Please enter your last name. No. <laughs> Welcome to the Middle East. Do you want to check your mail? Assess mi access mission control. Okay. Um, hit enter with your index finger so that your fingerprint may be processed. Um, I'm going to be a rebel and hit it with my um, thumb knuckle. Recognize Major General Gemini, Beta 2 clearance. See, even my thumb knuckle actually has fingerprint data, apparently. Look at the Middle East. Your mission is to neutralize all Iraqi installations. You've been given 200,000 credits, the monetary unit in which you may buy the following with your credits. Maverick missiles, very accurate, can only be used with a Warthog plane. Laser-guided bombs, cost 7,500. Same accuracy, the reason it's more expensive because it can be used by both the F-18 and the B-52. And H-bombs. Cost is 75,000 credits. H-bombs inflict massive damage and nuclear missions spread across the country in less than a year. This can only be used by the B-52. Okay. And then apparently those are our three planes available to us. I don't know why the Warthog is classified when it's probably the weakest of these. Just judging by how this is being laid out, but... Whatever. Apparently I need Alpha 2 clearance. <laughs> the secret to defeat the enemy is that it's a whole bunch of <laughs> extended ASCII characters. Okay, access mission control. Please hit enter with your index finger. No. Okay, so here's our game screen at the moment. So we can either attack a target, view our score, abort mission, or wait one month. Hmm. So we go attack target. What is your target? Um, well, we probably shouldn't go straight for the capital. Um, 
Maybe we should try diverting, diverting some of their attention or something. So let's go for the Arutba base. Or wait. Oh, apparently there can be multiple things at these different targets. So yeah, the Air, For ba Air Force base that's there. And we're going to use... We use the Warthog. And we're going to use Maverick Missiles. Are you sure? Yes. Results. Installation status deactivated. 99 casualties. Okay. So, I guess we just move on then. So, what do we want to attack next? Well, let's get rid of some chemical weapons. So, let's go Alquim. Or no, wait. Attack target first, and then Alquim. Chemical installation. This time we'll go for the F-18. Method. Laser guided bomb. Go for it. And that was a success as well. I guess if we wanted to be really crazy about it, we could just drop a nuke somewhere. Um, what seems to be a good place for a nuke blast? And Syria? I think I pronounced that right. It's it's hard for me to pronounce stuff like this. So attack target. Um, it says there's only an air force base there though. But I see the um army base as well. Huh. Oh, well, we'll go for the Air Force Base. Let's check out the nukes. So, B-52 Bomber, use a Fusion Bomb. Or H-Bomb. Sure, yes. H-Bomb defective or sabotage. Nuclear missions localized and will only affect the target. Okay. And apparently that somehow affected the M area as well. And I actually meant to go for B, <laughs> but it, I got confused because I didn't see the line there, so I thought it was the E. So what is my score at the moment? So I've destroyed three installations, casualties 90,000, score is 30,000. Okay, so it's basically, I'm guessing the higher, your the higher your casualties get, the worse your score gets. But like, I mean, given the way this is going, like, wouldn't you just pick all the cheapest stuff and attack all the cheapest stuff, because it doesn't look like there's any, um... It doesn't look like there's any consequences for just going with the cheapest stuff. Oh, wow. Um... I think the radiation's affecting a few things, because a lot of areas just went black. Oh, uh, yeah. Um... <laughs> take a look at what's happening to the casualty counter there. Because of the effects of the nuclear radiation. So... Actually, that can't be right, <laughs> because apparently my score... Oh, no, wait, it's because there's 10 installations destroyed. Okay, so it's sort of dividing things in a weird way. So... I mean, I'm not entirely certain what it is I'm trying to accomplish here to win. Okay, um, my B-52 just got destroyed. So I guess there's, like, random chances for stuff like that to happen. So I guess that's how you lose, is just bad luck? Is that what this comes down to, is entirely luck? Uh, there's only one place left that I can attack, really, so... Air Force Base... F-18, Laser Guided Bomb... Yeah, that's it. You have successfully destroyed all major installations. Here is your score. 25 installations destroyed, 2.9... or no. Yeah, 2.9 million casualties. Total score is 119,000 points. I would not plan a vacation in the Middle East if I were you. <laughs> uh, okay. So, as a game, <laughs> this screen left blank in memory of the victims of World War I, World War II, and anyone else who's experienced the horrors of 20th century warfare. And then quit the DOS. Yeah, this is just a... I don't know what to think about this program, because it's clearly like a game that's designed to be fun, but then at the same time, you're basically just bombing the entirety of Iraq. So, I don't really know who the intended target market for this game is. 
But at least the guy was only charging five Canadian dollars for it, so. And our last dig for today comes from Zinfidel ZT. DOS games backslash arcade backslash one unforg one? I happen to know exactly what this is, believe it or not. So this is actually the sequel to Morath's World, Morath's Dungeons of the Unforgiven. And we're going to see that if I just go right into it. Unforgive. Because we already have the, um, the standard resolution selection screen here. I don't know if I'm set up for SVGA properly. So I think I'm going to just avoid doing that. But we can at the very least go 360 by 480 with 256 colors. And there, Dungeons of the Unforgiven. This is a game I've been wanting to cover on Ancient DOS games. There's just one problem. It's not really that much different from the original Morath's world. Like, the graphics are better, and there's different kinds of enemies, and the gameplay is actually harder, but a lot of it is extraordinarily similar to the original Morath's world. So, like, just to give you an example here, so if we go in here, uh, select to create a new character, you know, I have to wonder if anybody ever actually won this contest here. Like, more if we're still around, I should just send him an email and ask. But yeah, so normal difficulty, and then we create a character, and we have a list of character types here, and as you can see, it's actually different from the original game, and the character choice you pick also determines your height in the game world. So, like, if you're picking a humanoid, you're going to be um, pretty normal size. If you pick giant, you're going to be, like, right up near the ceiling. Or if you pick the shrimp, you're going to be really close to the ground. So, let's actually just stick with the humanoid. And then roll new character till we get something that has decent stats. This isn't too bad. So, we'll go to design our own, which will drop the stats a little. And then we assign our points. Then type in our name... Character classes are all the same as in the original game. And now one of the one of the initial differences with this game compared to Morath's world is that you've got these little snakes that are giving you tips throughout. So, hail young mage, you've chosen to excel in both the art of battle and skill the skill of magic. Use both and you will be feared and powerful. Not to mention you kind of have to because fighters have always just died <laughs> in the Morath games. Your mission is to explore vast dungeons and defeat evil monsters. The deeper you venture, the more powerful the monsters. These dungeons are filled with brilliant little snakes who help confused little explorers find their way. Press F1 and they'll come find you. Or come help you. So yeah, the game actually the game plays very much like Morath's world. It even looks like it to a particular degree. But one of the things I should point out right away is that if we actually go up into the town here, because it always starts you like right in the dungeon. So if we just go up into town, one of the things that I want to point out about this game that does make it considerably different, well, aside from the fact that it's drawing very slowly, <laughs> I don't really have um, DOSBox set up to play this properly. So yeah, like it's different currencies and there's different things, you, a few different things you can do, but like the weapons are all the same and the armors are all the same and spells are all the same. So it's like a lot of the game is just very much the same as the original game. So that's why I haven't covered it on the show yet. I've kind of been thinking of doing like a video where I go back to a bunch of sequels that are not different enough from their original games to warrant doing an entire video about them. And that's kind of why I haven't covered this game on the show yet, because if I do make such a video, this game will absolutely be in it. So yeah, this isn't actually playing very well right now, because I don't have DOSBox set up properly for the Morath games. The Morath games require you to have a really high cycles count set, because of the way that the graphics rendering works. Although here's one thing that's different. You can see right here we've got the... Uh, step through this teleporter thing. So these are what actually take you to the different uh, modules of the game. So the full version of the, the shareware version here only has the first module, but the full version has multiple modules, and each module is basically like a different dungeon randomization with different kinds of monsters and such. So it's basically like chapters in a sense. 
Okay, so here's what I, the, one of the things I really wanted to point out. So, welcome to the Hellhole Inn. A tin sign reads, a night in our horrible hotel might not kill you. Please keep valuables in bed with you. Also, we are not responsible for your possessions, even if our staff stole them. When you stay at an inn, you will grow older unless you have some culture stock. The amount needed is your level cubed. So, I want to point out that you find culture stock in, well... <laughs> Small quantities at first, extraordinarily large quantities later, and your experience level cubed ultimately gets a little insane. So, like, I mean, staying at the inn, if you were, like, level 10, that means you would need a thousand culture stock to prevent from growing older, and by that time, you're probably only finding, like, maybe a hundred at a time and not very often, so that's kind of one of the gimmicks of the game is the fact that you have to avoid getting too old. <laughs> so like I mean, eight like age was a variable in the original game as well, but you never grow grew older. But here the age system is actually in full effect. Cuz yeah, you can see in the stats here right now, age is 17. So I don't know exactly how old you can get without totally being destroyed or something like i don't actually know what the age effect even has all i know is that younger is better as far as this game is concerned but then other than that it works pretty much like the original game so if you like more f's world then you'll probably like this one too